Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. How are you? Please head over to Better Than Food Film Reviews and check out a daily update on the 31 greatest horror films, in my opinion, for all of October. Every single day. Now let's get to some books. Prepare yourself some food and watch it during this review for maximum enjoyment. Or even better, press pause and go 36 hours without eating a fucking thing. Then come back to me on Tuesday. Watch this video, but have like cookies and cured meats and shit. But just stare at it and wait until the review is completely over before even touching it. The result will be very effective, I assure you. I think I read this uh, when, when I was in school, when I was in downtown Portland one winter. I specifically remember it was winter. And I was reading it while walking on the street. It was always raining and cold. It was always cold and raining and it was very, very appropriate. Definitely kind of accentuated the atmosphere. Charles Bukowski called him the greatest author who ever lived. He influenced the entire canon of 20th century modernist literature. We're talking Hemingway, Kafka, Hess, Thomas Mann, who described him as a descendant of Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. They're talking about the Norwegian author Nut Hampson. Hunger, or sult in Norwegian, is about hunger. Every kind of hunger that the word can pertain to. Moral hunger, religious hunger, romantic hunger, more than a little bit of political and power hunger, as we're soon to discover, and regular, good old-fashioned, miserable, fucked-up hunger hunger. As in, I'm starving. As in, I'm dying. As in, I'm tearing myself a fucking part. As in, I'm hungry! Our protagonist is a young writer wandering around the cold, harsh, and unforgiving streets of Christiania, which is now Oslo. His self-destructive characteristics are balanced by this very, very interesting sense of pride and charity, despite his unimaginable poverty, as his body catabolizes its muscles and organs and fat for energy as he's just slowly... He runs into the citizens of the city in the time and place who are fascinating in their own right, he chases women around and he even picks his confidence back up and more of that pride again after each meal he has. Even when he is at his worst, when he's in a psychic or religious fervor and he's at odds with everything and everyone around him, he refuses food in this odd, distinctly, again, human pride, believing himself superior in some capacity and patting himself on the back for refusing the charity, right? He doesn't... He doesn't hate society or blame other people, per se, but he is constantly kind of asking this very existentially misanthropic why me sort of thing, right? Not that, like, the question to the God or... Like, the constant questioning to the God or gods. What was it that ailed me? Was the hand of the Lord turned against me? But why just against me? Why, for that matter... Not just as well, a man in South America. When I considered the matter over, it grew more and more incomprehensible to me that I, of all others, would be selected as an experiment for the Creator's whims. It was, to say the least, a peculiar mode of procedure to pass over a whole world of other humans in order to reach me. But, no, out of context, it might seem a little bit narcissistic, but we are, the, we are in his head the entire time, so it's his, constantly his thoughts and him relating his own thoughts to us. But then when even the tiniest thing seems to work, when the tiniest bit of luck finds him, he is elated and it's all praise the good Lord and, and what have you. These massive highs and lows kind of remind you of like some sick, fucked up blood sugar roller coaster. As you're likely anticipating, this man's condition becomes worse and worse and worse and worse. The mental, physical, and emotional deterioration becomes almost unbearable as we move further and further down the pit of this hell he's descending into. Though, of course, the book becomes very, very interesting. The internal monologue takes a very, very sinister tone. This unreliable and unforgettable deteriorating narrator decomposing in front of our very eyes. 
and yet often exuberant in and of his condition. He positively, absolutely refuses to be a victim, in a sense. Except for, of course, when he's wallowing in a sea of self-pity, but it's more of kind of like a... He's not blaming people, which is interesting. And things start to become a little weird, a little too too close for comfort. When I got to the corner of Tomtegaden and the railway place, the street commenced suddenly to swim before my eyes. It buzzed vacantly in my head, and I staggered up against the wall of the house. I could simply go no further. Couldn't even straighten myself from the cramped position I was in. As I fell up against it, so I remained standing, and I felt that I was beginning to lose my senses. My insane anger had augmented this attack of exhaustion. I lifted my foot and stamped on the pavement. I also tried several other things to try and regain my strength. I clenched my teeth, wrinkled my brows, and I rolled my eyes despairingly. It helped a little. My thoughts grew more lucid. It was clear to me that I was about to succumb. I stretched out my hands and pushed myself back from the wall. The streets still danced wildly around me. I began to hiccup with rage and I wrestled from my very inmost soul with my misery. I made a right gallant effort not to sink down. It was not my intention to collapse. No, I would die standing. A dray rolled slowly by and I noticed there are potatoes in it. But out of sheer fury and stubbornness, I take into my head to assert that they are not potatoes, but cabbages. And I swore frightful oaths that they were cabbages. I heard quite well what I was saying, and I swore this lie wittingly, repeating time after time just to have the vicious satisfaction of perjuring myself. I got intoxicated with the thought of this matchless sin of mine. I raised three fingers in the air and swore with trembling lips in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost that they were cabbages. So this style of writing appears simple, but it's razor sharp, economical, effectively disturbing on a gut level. Oh man, it's good. Real good. And he really begins to completely lose it, which is of course great for us, the readers. I break my pencil between my teeth jump to my feet, tear my manuscript in two, tear each page in two, fling my hat down in the street, and trample upon it. I'm lost, I whispered to myself. Ladies and gentlemen, I am lost. I utter no more than these few words as long as I stand there and tramp upon my hat. A policeman is standing a few steps away watching me. He is standing in the middle of the street, and he only pays attention to me. As I lift my head, our eyes meet. Maybe he has been standing there for a long time watching me. I pick up my hat, I put it on, and I go over to him. So again, there's something strikingly human, fundamentally human, about this stubbornness and will to survive. And there's also something very funny. The madness, the, abs the absolute madness, horror, and tragedy, the whole thing, there's still something funny. And it, you know, it's a magnificent novel, no question. And here's the thing about Newt Hampson. He was a Nazi supporter. He mailed his Nobel Prize to Goebbels, who eventually invited him to meet with himself and Hitler. And then when he goes to dinner with Hitler and Goebbels, he starts complaining about the Nazi who was in charge of Norway, asking that the Norwegian prisoners that were locked up be set free, which completely pissed off Hitler. Apparently, according to some sources, uh, Hampson was the only one who could actually get a word in with Hitler in an argument. It took days for Hitler to stop being pissed off at Hampson. Yet Hampson still wrote a eulogy after his death. Went to the grave himself a National Socialist. I mean, he, he probably was in his 90s when he died. And pissed off the entire country of Norway. In short, he wrote one hell of a great book and pissed off everybody. Everybody. Go eat a sandwich and remember what John Waters said. If you go home with someone and they don't have any food. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> and if they don't have any books, uh, forget it. Don't fuck them. Have a great day, guys. Again, go check out Better Than Food Film Reviews. Lots of great stuff going on there. Please subscribe. Because today, coupled with this review, I'm reviewing The Hunger 
with David Bowie. And many thanks to Ariel and Emmy who have given me some shout outs on their channels. Please subscribe and donate. To all of you who have donated already, you are very, very kind. You are so kind and you are helping a many, many, many people, young and old, find great books. And I sincerely appreciate that. And I am sincerely happy to have met you and to be doing what I'm doing and to be having this dialogue and communication and uh, this, um, uh, this family that's kind of starting. So thank you so much. Have a great day.